If you were to make a very short list of the top books written about brain science and its implications upon teaching, learning, and working, then brain rules written by Dr. John Medina would have to be at the top. It's not just his ability to glean the most solid and pertinent data from the reams of studies that have been done. It's Dr. Medina's capacity to articulate principles in the most cogent, compelling, and entertaining way. An affiliate professor at the University of Washington Medical School and a New York Times best-selling author, we welcome Dr. Medina to the Edge. John, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, your your books are absolutely fascinating, and so. As you know, at the GCLI, we focus on how we can develop leadership in young people. And we, we like to look at the brain science. So in a word, from your experience with brain science, to what extent can people actually be taught to be more emotionally intelligent, to be better communicators, and to lead? Well, you're not going to like the answer. We have no idea. <laughs> I mean, in real terms, the uh, uh, stuff in the brain sciences, we don't even know how you know how to write your name. We don't know how you know how to pick up a glass of water and drink it. And if we did, we'd probably get several Nobel Prizes. So we're very far out for being able to give you an exact, practical, real-world answer to developing leadership in kids. Now, we're not clueless about how the brain works. In fact, when you ask the question, what came to mind almost immediately is something we call executive function. Executive function has two very powerful peers that anchor it into areas of the brain that are actually being characterized. The first peer is something we would just call cognitive control. You can think of it as focus, you can think of it as the ability to take a look at a whole range of, of inputs and then make a heuristic out of it, like an organizing framework. That stuff is really important to the brain and people that can do it really well are often very good, believe it or not, at math. There's another strong component to executive function, though, that doesn't have much to do with cognitive control, but has everything to do with emotional control. And it's there where we might get a little closer to answering your question in real terms. If you've got strong executive function, you often have very good impulse control. You might want very much to do a series of things, but you've got this amender that goes off in your brain that says, nah, you know, I want to do it, but I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to. And I think that's probably something very powerful and needed in leadership. So the question you can ask from a research perspective is, given that executive function might tangentially touch your question, how can you improve executive function? And now we're on much more solid footing. We actually know how to improve executive function. Great. Can you give us some indications? How do you do it? I sure can. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting, it's not necessarily obvious because the research world didn't start out asking questions, how can we improve executive function? This research actually came from trying to figure out why people age differently. There are some people that age beautifully. They age like, you might remember Mike Wallace from the old 60 Minutes. He was 89 years old and still flying all over the world, you know, giving hell to leaders who have been doing problems or having weird things happen to them. He was prosecutorially smart. And there's a whole group of people that are aging beautifully, just like Mike Wallace aged. I think he didn't die until he was 93 and he was pretty active up until that time. But there's a whole other group of people that aren't aging very well at all. In fact, you might say they're aging more like um, Keith Richards. <laughs> um, they, uh, these people have a high incidence of, not that Keith Richards does, I think Keith Richards is probably excellent, but he looks like he's old. And you can have a whole group of people that have high incidence of Alzheimer's disease, high incidence of undifferentiated dementia. They have a tendency to have lots of uh, anxiety and depressive disorders. They retire early. They die early. They're not aging very well at all. And the question you can ask, the research question was asked, how come there is this whole group of people that age like Keith Richards and a whole group of people that age like Mike Wallace? What was the difference between those two? The answer to that question turned out to be a powder keg and produced a whole line of funding of research directions that are still going on this day. Whether you are aging like Mike Wallace or Keith Richards rises or falls on the presence or absence of a single independent variable. And that independent variable is aerobic exercise. The more you aerobic exercise or have that in your life, the more likely you are to age like Mike Wallace. 
and not like Keith Richards. So that whole funding actually produced a rabbit trail going down the cognitive world that eventually landed on our topic, which is executive function. We now know that if you have 150 minutes of aerobic exposure in a seven day period, and this is just moderate exercise, I mean, <laughs> I'm the spokesperson for this group because I have no confirmation bias. I don't want this data, these data to be true, but unfortunately they are. And you can show that if you even take somebody who is sedentary, which would be somebody like me, and exercise me for a period of time, you can improve your executive function anywhere between 20 to 80 percent depending upon the study that you're looking at. So we actually know how to improve executive function. So powerful are these data that when I wrote uh, Brain Rules, I knew exercise was going to be in the f my first chapter. I actually put a treadmill in my office and every time I was writing a grant or a paper or these days a book, I would just walk on my treadmill about 1.8 miles an hour and I went from 248 pounds to now 211, which is where I am. And I will say, I've never felt intellectually stupid in my life, but I have never felt intellectually clearer since then. So to get to your question now, to finally answer it, if you want to improve executive function, I'll call that leadership here, but impulse control and the ability to do math. If you want to improve executive function, for heaven's sakes, get the kids off their butts and have them start exercising, aerobic exercise, and have them do it all the time. In fact, the data are so strong, you could make a very powerful argument that there should be school uniforms in every school. Do you know what those uniforms should be? They should be gym clothes. And you should have a guided workout the entire day punctuated with islands of learning if you really want to improve things that the American education system I could arguably uh, 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 get a healthy dose of uh, medicine for. Aerobic exercise would be key. Wow, that was incredibly compelling. Not to mention very entertaining. It's also not an opinion. These things are anchored in peer review in the peer-reviewed literature, from Art Kramer to uh, Kaufman and Berchtold. There's a tremendous number of people that are working on this, all of them trying to figure out the difference between Mike Wallace and Keith Richards. Go figure. <laughs> in your book, one of the rules as well was around sleep. How important would you say it is for those who are interested in developing leadership among their students to make sure that they and their parents understand good sleep habits? I'll call it insanely important, but from some fairly recent data, you know, it wasn't until about eight or nine years ago that we actually knew why you need to sleep. You know, people say they need to sleep because they want to have an energy restoration event, but that's actually not true. The brain is actually metabolically very active at night. In fact, it's more rhythmically active at night than it is during the day. And you move around at night and you're, so you're just burning up all kinds of energy. And so the question was asked was, why do you need to sleep if it's not energy restorative? From an evolutionary perspective, being in a semi-unconscious state for eight hours is insane. You're going to have a nocturnal predator that's going to kill you very, very quickly. A lot of animals in the Serengeti don't sleep for eight hours at a clip. They sleep in 15, 20 minute increments and then go around, move around somewhere so that they don't become a midnight snack for some feline predator. Okay? So why do you need to sleep? Well, we're beginning to find the answer, but the answer is extraordinary. We now know that when you go to sleep and you enter into a very particular area, uh, 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 a stage of sleep, your brain turns on and begins to repeat thousands of times and in a compressed format things you learned during the day. No kidding. We call it offline processing. Stuff that you've been accumulating all day and you've got all the sensory input that's going into, at night you begin to organize it. And we think the reason why you need to sleep is so that you can just shut off all of the other sensory input that would bombard you otherwise and instead focus in on the things you needed to understand during the course of the day. There's also a flushing mechanism that where you're flushing out excess electrons that you've been building up during the course of the day. You want to get rid of those if you can because they can slam into other molecules and create what we call free radicals which are kind of toxic to the brain. There are lots of reasons to sleep that have nothing to do with energy restoration. Primarily we now know why you need to sleep. You don't need to sleep to restore energy. You need to sleep so you can learn. Wow. And if that's the case, 
it makes an extraordinarily compelling argument for getting a regular night's sleep for the rest of your life. There should be no such thing as an all-nighter anymore. Stop it, get rid of it, it doesn't work, you just you ruin just whatever sleep cycle you're under, and it's anti-learning. Pro-learning would be a steady amount of sleep at a regular time, at a regular pace, seven days a week, 365 days a year, till you're dead. The implications of that upon educational practice, as I know you know, are hugely profound when we think about things like homework, when we think about how exams are scheduled in multiple courses simultaneously, all sorts of, about the start of school days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, one last question that, that I have for you. One of the passages in your book, or the parts that was the most compelling to me, it really made a light bulb go off was when you talked from an evolutionary perspective about the importance of human beings learning to collaborate. Yes, yes. For, for, for one who spends a lot of time thinking about how teachers can develop leaders, collaboration is huge. I wonder if you could recall that argument a little bit and then perhaps give us some tips about how people can collaborate better. Sure. Well, there's a, a, um, a puzzle that we had to figure out in the brain science world, and it's still an ongoing discussion in many uh, uh, corridors of science. But the question you can ask is, how come we became the apex predator? I mean, it's nuts how weak we are. Look at our fingernails. These don't do well against, I don't know, your cat. Look at our canines. Yeah? The raccoons have better more aggressive mouths than we do. Take a look at our thermal exchange with our environment. We're pinkish and mostly naked. I mean, from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, we have got all kinds of wimpy, 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 wimpiness about us and not a whole lot of reasons to become the crowning apex predator of planet Earth. Well, we think we have an understanding of why we became apex predator. Well, if you want to become the big dog in planet Earth, you're going to have two choices. You can either double your biomass by getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That would be an elephant-like model. Or you could go another route. There's another way to double your biomass without doubling your biomass. By the way, if you want to double your biomass and then get bigger and bigger and bigger, you can go through millions of generations. And it can take millions of years in order for you to become apex. But there's another way. You could double your biomass not by creating something bigger in yourself, but by creating the concept of ally and you and your buddy begin coordinating your behaviors in such fashion that you can actually act as one. If you're going to do that, you create necessarily the concept of cooperation between two disinterested parties or at least independent parties. But if you can get them to coordinate your activities pretty soon, you can conquer the world. So the question you can ask is, if you can double your biomass by creating the concept of ally, you necessarily create selective pressure on cognitive gadgets in the brain. And so the question you can ask is, what in the brain do we know of that allows us to coordinate our behaviors, to allow us to read each other's thoughts and minds, perhaps in a hunt or for whatever purposes of gathering fire? Well, we have such a concept in our heads. It's called theory of mind, big T, little o, big M. If you've got good theory of mind, you have the ability to understand the intentions and motivations of somebody else. It has two very specific components to it. Number one, it's the ability to peer inside someone else's psychological interior and understand the rewards and punishment systems inside that interior. Second, it's the ability to understand that the, the motivations and intentions inside someone else, your buddy, your ally, are going to be probably different than yours because you guys aren't the same people. So it's the ability to boundary those and understand someone else's potential uh, uh, behaviors that becomes important. I actually call it John Medina's second law of marriage. <laughs> what is obvious to you is obvious to you. Okay? But if you've got good theory of mind, you're going to learn to collaborate. Pretty soon you can take over the world and that becomes selective pressure. So to answer your question, collaboration is at the heart of our survival instincts and is, at, it is the left ventricle of how we survived. And if that's the case, aiding and abetting all purposes that surround theory of mind, collaboration and becoming socially competent, is probably at least as important as learning fractions. So those are three big rules that we can certainly focus on as educators. Let our students exercise, exercise, exercise. Make sure that they sleep yep. and 
learn and develop and practice an effective theory of mind. Yeah, so you have to have lots of pro-social exposure. So let the kids interact with each other. Yep, real live flesh and blood. Not big in Facebook, but I'm close. The, you want to have as many different interactions as you can if you're going to aid in the bet that collaborative instinct that allowed us to come out of the muck and made us take over the world. John, on behalf of the Gardner Carney Leadership Institute, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for asking me.